Why not? So welcome to the Knox Council meeting. Before I, as we start, I want to give you an acknowledgement of country. Sunday first official proceedings, I'd like to acknowledge that we are meeting on Jara country, of which the members and elders of the Jara Jara community and their full bears have been custodians for many centuries and have performed age-old ceremony, celebration, initiation and renewal. We acknowledge their living culture and the unique role in the life of this region. Council meetings are audio and video recorded are made available to the public via electronic media, including YouTube. We have all councillors present. And <coughs> Is there any declarations of interest or conflict? None. Thank you. Confirmation of minutes of the 16th of August 2022. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Leonard. Uh, I'd like to move it. But the minutes of the meeting of Mount Alexander Shire Council held on the 16th of August 2022 be confirmed with the following amendments. Item 13, confidential items, which begins. The Council closes the ordinary meeting of Council on the 16th of August 2022 in accordance with section 66, brackets 2, brackets A, of the Local Government Act 2020, in order to consider confidential information. No, I'm adding something. It's not actually in the uh, meeting at the time, but it does not change the, uh, the sentiment of the, it just gives more information as to why the meeting was uh, deemed to be confidential for now. Um, the contains, as defined in the Local Government Act, under Section 3, definition of confidential information. <coughs> Section F, personal information, being information which, if released, would result in the unreasonable disclosure of information about any person or their personal events. I'd like to move that retrospective record. Thank you. Is there a second? <coughs> Cordy. Any discussion? Those in favour? Carried. That takes us to item five, which is some acknowledgements. The first one is Mayor Gwen Lister. The second, Mayor Council staff and Shire community pay tribute to the sad passing of Her Majesty the Queen. His Majesty King Charles III has been proclaimed as Australia's new head of state. For 70 years, Queen Elizabeth II reigned as Australia's head of state. During her reign, she visited Australia 16 times, visiting every state and territory. The Queen consulted with 16 Prime Ministers and 16 Governor Generals served in her name. She was the patron of more than 20 Australian charities and associations. Her compassion, dedication, distinction, devotion, and discretion was admired by many in the manner in which she performed her duties. The community are invited to sign the online condolence book available on the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet website. As part of the 1954 Royal Visit to Australia by Her Majesty the Queen and His Royal Highness the Duke of Edinburgh, the Queen conducted an address of loyalty to crowds of well-wishers from the train at the Castlemaine Railway Station. Council has flown the national flag at half-mast half -mast, and as a sign of respect, we invite everyone present here and watching online to now observe a minute silence.
Thank you. Unfortunately, the community, unfortunately, the community seems to have lost a few people recently, and the following have been associated with either the Shire of Mount Alexander or the Shire of Metcalf and the city of Castlewain, etc., over the years. Bail Lynn Sutherland. The Mayor, Council and staff at Mount Alexander Shire Council extend our sincere condolences to the Sutherland family and friends following the recent passing of Glenn. Glenn lost his battle with motor neurone disease and passed away on the 17th of August 2022. <coughs> he made many contributions to our community, including as a very active member of Council's Audit and Risk Committee, a former board member and chair of Castlemaine Health for 12 years, and as an importer of fine alpaca clothing. Vale Dorothy Dot Pollard. <laughs> the Mayor, Councils and Staff at Mount Alexander Shire Council extend our sincere condolences to the Pollard family and friends following the recent passing of Dot. Born in Taradale, Doc Pollard, D. Antonio, came from a large family with ties to the region dating back to the late 1800s. She documented the history of her family's involvement in the First World War and was an active participant in community organisations. Doc was hired in 1975 as an assistant domiciliary services officer at the Shire of Metcalf prior to amalgamation, and later became the Community Services Officer, establishing Wheels on Meals, podiatry, home health, and handyman services for that shire. Doc was instrumental in establishing the Tudor Senior Citizens Community Centre, as well as being a long-standing committee member. Doc retired in 1998, still working for the Mount Alexander Shire Council in AIDS care services. Council acknowledges her contribution to our community. Vale, Lawrence, Larry O'Toole. The Mayor, Councillors and staff at Mount Alexander Shire Council extend our sincere condolences to the O'Toole family and friends. Following the recent passing of Larry, we wish to pay our respects to Lawrence to Xavier O'Toole, Larry, an important figure in Castleman's Hot Rod story, who has died age 72. The chairman of the Castleman Hot Rod Centre contributed to recording the history of the region and putting on many memorable community events. Larry and his wife Mary were the founders of Graffiti Publications publishers of Castlemaine's Australian Street Rotting Magazine and other publications related to street rotting, which are recognised both nationally and internationally. Our thoughts are with his family and loved ones. <coughs> Vale, Uncle Jack Charles. The Mayor, Councillors and staff of Mount Alexander Shire Council extend our sincere condolences to the Charles family and friends following the recent passing of Uncle Jack. We wish to pay our respects to Uncle Jack Charles, one of Australia's most celebrated indigenous, indigenous elders who has died age 79. A boon run, Daja run, Wira run, and Yorta Yorta man. He was a beloved and respected actor, musician, and potter. Uncle Jack helped found Australia's first Indigenous theatre company and was advocate for equality and truth telling. He performed on a number of occasions in Castlemaine, including the State Festival at various times. He will be remembered for all he did and gave to our community. Our thoughts are with his family and loved ones. Thank you. <laughs> the 
takes us to public question time. I would like to suspend the standing orders. Councillor Gordy, seconder. Councillor Henderson, all in favour? Carried. We have one written one. And I'll just um, mention something. Public question time rules. Each speaker in addressing the council will generally be limited to one question and lay on up to three minutes. <coughs> Shall extend the shortest courtesy and respect to the council and the processes under which it operates. Shall take direction from myself as the chair of the meeting whenever, whenever I call upon a speaker to do so. Shall not attempt to enter in discussion or debate with council, however, Councillors may ask questions of clarification of the speaker. <clears throat> Please note that as chair, I may cease or reject a question being unacceptable <coughs> under clause 12.1.5 of the Governance Rules 2020. If so, I'll advise the speaker on the basis for this decision where being necessary. I, know, I may also require the speaker to leave the chamber in accordance with the Governance Rules. First question is from Malcolm Mars, and I'd ask the governance officer, principal governance officer, to address it for me. I'll read out yes. Mr. Mars's question and the answer. Um, this is a question for Mr. Malcolm Mars. I would be grateful if you could please include the following question for the next council meeting on Tuesday, 20th September. At the last council meeting on the 16th of August, under item 13 on the agenda, the meeting was closed in accordance with six, section 662A of the Local Government Act 2020 in order to consider confidential information. As the transparency of council decisions, actions and information is an overarching governance principle under the provisions of section 9 of the Local Government Act, can council please provide the following information? <coughs> Details of the matter which is considered. The ground or grounds for determining to close the meeting to the public by, the, by reference to the grounds specified in the definition of confidential information in section 3.1. An explanation of why the specified grounds or grounds applied and the role and position of the person who has the responsible, who was responsible for initiating the decision to close the meeting. As the Principal Governance Officer, I wish to thank Mr. Mars for submitting his question and acknowledging he is what was correct in part in his queries around the meeting of Council Minutes on 16th of August 2022. In line with Section 65A and B of the Local Government Act, it should be admitted that the closure of the Council meeting to the public was due to a confidential matter that contained information as defined by Section 31F of the Act. This has been rectified earlier in, the, in this meeting with the confirmation of the minutes and the amendment moved by Councillor Henderson. Further, in accordance with the Local Government Act sections 18.1H and 46.2D, Council's Governance Rule in, and Council's Governance Rules 2020, Council meeting agendas and any recommendations Within that agenda is a collaboration between the Mayor and the Chief Executive Officer. Any decision to close said meeting to the public is the decision of Council. Thank you. Does any Councillor wish to make a comment? <coughs> Thank you. Does there any member of the public have a question? The lady on the left. Thank you. Come to the microphone. So, we can just before we do that, say refer to the confidential sections of the meeting and say that this council has a record very rarely holding confidential meetings, and it's usually a matter of process which we are required to pass a certain motion by the local government. Act. We do it, and it's it's just yeah, confidential because it's the nature of the beast, but it's nothing. We're certainly 
are not waiting to make decisions with drivers which should be held in common. This council has never, as long as I'm on council, never will, I'm sure anyone around this table will never tolerate anything like a confidential meeting where the matter can be legally discussed in public. Thank you. Thanks, Kat. Thanks, Councillor Henderson. Sorry, I apologize. Yeah, you might. Uh, my name is Nola Juniper. You want me to take a read? Yeah, that's fine. Um, my name is Nola Juniper, long term resident of Ellery's Road, Faraday. I'm here with regard to the operation of Earl's Trucking Business in Ellery's Road without a permit. I mentioned at the July council meeting that our house, where we've lived for over 40 years, is very close to the actual road of Ellery's Road. We firstly communicated with Shire almost two day, almost to the day two years ago when this issue. This was after having discussions with the business owners reading the impact their significant operation was having on the safety of Valerie's road users, the impact on the infrastructure, and personal impacts on our family and property. The applicant knew they required a permit to operate in Valerie's road at the time, and that we were living in a farming zone. So we are living in a farming zone. So. At the July Council meeting, I asked what rules or conditions are the trucking company operating under in the interim until a decision has been made on the permit application. I was later informed that the conditions are solely EPA ones. As there are almost no conditions, shouldn't the company cease to operate from this site while full assessment of all aspects of that operation has been conducted and a formal decision made? Right. Uh, Director O'Neill. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mrs. Jennifer, for your question. Um, in response uh, to allowing the um, business to operate while the decisions we've had could be cancelled, um, this is allowed under the, the planning um, regulations. Um, so we have determined that while uh, council officers are uh, assessing the um, application for the use of the site as a depot, um, that the business is allowed to uh, operate um, until such time a decision has been made and a recommendation put before council um, for determination of the planning application. Thank you. With, with no rules except the APA ones. So uh, it is possible for the business to continue to operate um, with regard to um, uh, its uh, task um, for managing the business while the determination is made as well by the planning scheme and the uh, determination of the application as we go forward. Um, uh, we do note, um, and there have been conversations with the applicant with regard to the potential impact that the business has on the road network and the uh, surrounding safety and maintenance of the location. Um, and that has been acknowledged by the, uh, the business of the time as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Councillor Cordy. <coughs> Sorry. Yeah, just, of course, just a question in relation to this matter. Um, Director Anir, when, when do you expect this matter to come back to Council? <coughs> Thank you, Councillor Cordy. Um, the matter will be first um, heard at our uh, applicant project support meeting uh, on the 4th of October. Um, where um, the applicant objectors and supporters have an opportunity to present to cancel their case. I mean, we then follow on to the October meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next person. So, my name is Shane McDonald, Ms. Dean Cooper. Do you want three minutes each or three minutes? <laughs> And um, we have a proposal as a request for the banning of glyphosate in the Mount Alexander Shire, otherwise known as Roundup, but also in other um, websites. Yeah, continue. Okay, um, and so we have a, a petitions here. There's approximately 450 people from your community. Um, so it's presented as a gift from them that uh, also support that. Um, so I just want to table this. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you. Just the, the <coughs> principal governor's officer will accept it and there's information there for each councillor to have a look at it. Right. Okay. There's links. Many councils and cities and countries have banned it already in Australia and internationally. Right. Well, we will look at it and one of our meetings during the next month or so, we'll discuss the item for you and get back to you. Thank you. The yeah, governance uh, will review the petition and then go through the process. Okay. Right. Next question. Mark. Right. Uh, Sally Cascain and a question directed to uh, Director Ania. In July, I asked about Council's policy regarding recording, monitoring, and preserving mature and significant trees in our town and shire. I understood then that there would be further investigations into these issues, and that is um, really what I'd like to ask about the progress of the further to that. I commend the Council for their Environment Strategy 2015 to 25, which emphasises protecting the natural environment and leading by example. I would suggest a register of mature and significant trees, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous, is one way to show the community how seriously this statement is taken, and also a list of practical steps shown to monitor and preserve the health of these trees made known to the community to really show commitment to this important strategy. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Director Anir. Um, thank you, Ben, and thank you, Sally, for your question. Um, uh, Council has prepared a, a tree management plan and guideline um, in which sets out the approaches for Council officers to follow with regard to the management of trees within our show uh, under the responsibility of Council. This plan will be uh, briefed to councillors, sorry, this guideline, I should say, will be briefed to councillors in the coming months and then be presented uh, for an endorsement by councillors at a future council meeting. I uh, believe it will cover the, uh, the aspects that you had outlined in your question today. Um, and in addition, um, I also confirm that we do have, um, the, we do a, um, a review of all trees within our shire on a three year rotation basis, which allows us to monitor and understand the significant trees or possibly those that require action to be taken for maintaining the safety of our community. So thank you. Can I just say, man, I seem to remember being presented with our, our tree uh, management officer with a remarkable bit of software where you actually goes around the streets and public places and records every tree. Not just a sample, but every tree is now on its way to ending up in a, a database and that can then be checked and updated every year. It's quite remarkable. So uh, don't despair for it. No, <laughs> good to hear that. Thank you. Is there any other questions? Can you come up to that? Yes, you can. Yeah. Good evening, my name is uh, Milton Nameskita, AMZQUITA, lot owner 4647 Ellerys Road. And my question is in regards to again the depot at uh, Transport for Pearls Transport. If a decision should be made regarding um, a depot to go ahead, will that be setting a precedent for others to do likewise or for businesses to be set up? Uh, around that area that do that sort of trade. Director Anina, uh, thank you, Matt, and um, thank you for the question. Um, it's, uh, I'm not able to comment on future potential applications uh, that may come to Council um, for the area that's been applied. However, I can confirm that all applications are assessed on its mer on their merits in line with um, the manual exam of the Australian Planning Scheme. And as required, I referred to other um, agencies uh, for consideration depending on the application that's put forward. So while I'm not able to um, in, uh, respond to any potential future requests, I can say that they are all requests are assessed against the planning scheme um, and uh, taken into consideration any referrals required for any state agencies um, or the referral agencies that we may require depending on the application. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you. Well, my name is Rosalie Deruda. Yeah. Um, I'm obviously with my partner in crime. <laughs> we live on, oh, so we have property 46, 47 Ellerys Road. So we're right on the corner of Polites Road and Ellerys Road. Mm -hmm. um, I've just got a question in regards to maintenance. And it's considering we've tried to get four items removed of the nature strip um, on several occasions. So um, on the 26th of May, I rang. And on the 27th of May, I emailed pictures of where the items were that had to be removed because they were just dumped. Um, and on the 8th of September, I emailed again and they haven't been removed. Now we're four months later and the items are still scattered around the corner of Amelie's Road. Um, my question to council mm -hmm. is, <clears throat> if this trucking company goes ahead, what is tra transport in Bariana goes ahead. Who's responsible for the maintenance of Ellery's Road? And will council respond in a more timely manner uh, when we report poor conditions of that road? And also, will you look at the dust factor? Because that's actually not in the traffic report, as I understand it to be. Sorry, that's a really long question that consists of three parts. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yes, um, Call director in here. What type of items are you talking about? Oh, so I'm talking about a rim. So there's a rim there, there's a tire there, and there is a television oh. screen. Now, I took photos of it and sent it to council and said, These are the locations, these are the objects. Is it possible just to come along and pick them up? I can't take them to Kintonshire because the TV doesn't fit in the back of the Navara. Sorry. Fair enough. Fair enough. I thought you might have been talking about trees or something. No, 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 no. no. I'm right. talking about rubber and steel and so on. Fine. Director O'Neill. Thank you, man. Um, uh, I will take my notice, uh, the request that you put forward with regards to the items that are left on the nature strip to understand uh, what action may have been taken by council officers. So I will I'll come back to you um, on those requests that you may previously. I'm sorry, I don't have knowledge of those right now today to respond to you. Um, uh, the, uh, the last question with regard to dust. Um, uh, the amenity of the area with regard to any application that was taken into consideration, and this includes uh, the potential impact of dust on the, on the community, so that will be taken into consideration with the um, proposals uh, and the assessment undertaken by um, the camp, uh, the statutory framers that will then uh, inform the briefing for the councillors. And the second question, I'm sorry, which I know is the most important one, it was your middle question. Um, the middle question, will council, the council respond in a timely manner when we bring up and go, uh, we're going to lose our teeth if we drive on Ellery's Road because <laughs> it's so corrugated. Yeah, um, uh, I'd have to, I'd have to uh, look at the uh, response time to date voting. I'd have to have a look at the response time to understand whether they're in, within line with that policy. We do have a standard policy that uh, has response times depending on whether it's an email communication or formal uh, letter or a uh, phone call. So I'd have to look at that to understand what, what has been the situation here. But yeah. um, council officers, um, for any request, work towards our customer service, uh, customer response. Um, okay. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Cordy. Um, question for Director in here. I think there was a question in there about who's going to maintain the road. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> okay. um, thank you, Councillor um, So, with regard to the maintenance of the, of, of the road, Council um, has that responsibility overall. However, um, if a planning application requires some adjustments to a road based on the application itself, um, that may be included as a condition um, if a planning application was approved. However, I note in this situation, um, the planning application has not either been approved or denied at this point in time, so I can't respond to any specific requests on that. But conditions may be applied to the application um, if it was to move ahead. Thank you. So, will you let us know? Sorry. Um, uh, the, uh, if the application is recommended for approval and if there are any conditions, on an application, if it was presented to councillors for consideration for approval, it would clearly state that those uh, conditions that are placed on the application, and that will be part of the uh, October Council meeting. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir.
My name's Norm McLean, and I reside in Elwich Road. Um, I have a question for you guys. Between my place and Clever Knowles, there's been a new culvert put there. The way I understood it, that culvert was rated to carry a fire truck or perhaps on the outside of the semi trailer, which would be semi trailer would go about 38 tops 40 ton. While the wheels are running, they be doubles, 67 ton to 70 ton. Now, is that culvert good enough to stand that kind of weight continually if their depot goes ahead? Director, Director Anir. Thank you, man, um, and thank you for the question. So in assessing the application, uh, council officers have taken into consideration the entire road network and all of the road assets that are included within that. Um, the assessment of the Coleman and other assets, assets within the road network will be taken into consideration um, for the use uh, of, of the uh, potential depot that is a, a subject of the matter of this planning application. Um, and the details that are provided by the applicants with the uh, conditions of their business so the answer is it will be assessed um, in relation to the, uh, all of the infrastructure uh, along that road uh, section. Thank you. Any other questions? No, thank you very much. I would like to do resumption of standing on the Councillor McClure. Councillor Bristol, all in favour? Carry. Item seven, petitions and letters. There is none, apart from one we've just received. <coughs> Item eight, committee reports, Neil. Item nine, officers reports, community, nine double one, nine one point one. Is community grants awarded 2022 round two? Councillor Um, So I'll just get the executive summary. The purpose of this paper is to provide council with the outcome of the community grants program 2022 round two and to outline the decision process undertaken by officers for the allocation of funds. I will move the recommendation that council notes the allocation of funding for round two of the 2022 Community Grants Program, consisting of 22 applications for a total allocation of $49,709. Second up, Councillor McClough. Councillor Mia. So, this is the second round of Community Grants for the year. Um, a really great program that we have at Council, which allows um, community groups and individuals to put forward um, ideas really that they need help funding and then uh, officers weigh these against the criteria and decide uh, and decide which ones can be funded. Um, we receive a lot of these applications and, uh, and are able to fund a lot of them, which is great. I think this time we are funding 15 applications, 14 small grants, and one partnership grant. And a couple that I'm really interested in, just picking from the list, um, there's one called Caravan Fix Me Up, which is a collaborative project between a few different partners, including Goldfields LLEN, Delkaya Health, and Cusman Secondary College. The aim of this one is to renovate and restore two dilapidated caravans that Delkaya Health is currently, currently using for emergency accommodation for young people experiencing homelessness within our Shire. I think that's a really fantastic project and I'm really excited to see how this one goes. Um, another one that sounds really amazing is from Delkaya Health and this one is called the TGD Binders Project. It's a safe space for trans and gender diverse folks to try binders locally in a safe environment. Um, I know that this service is going to be a real game changer for a lot of people um, in our community who are trans or gender diverse, especially some of our young people who might not feel as supported in this area right now. <laughs> um, 
Another one is called Thriving, Casamone Fringe Supports Youth and Disability Arts Engagement. And this project is about um, Casamone Fringe engaging in arts work to support local youth and people living with a disability to create um, artworks and partner with Business Mount Alexander to encourage local businesses to put it in their shop front windows. Um, these are just a taste of the projects that have been funded this time. It's, um, it's really exciting to see the things that are going on within our community that people are able to, to do because we can help them out a little bit. Thank you. Any other council wish to comment? Nobody, all in favour of the motion? Carriage. 9.12, <coughs> the Bill Woodsville Recreation Reserve, Sports Lighting and an All Gender Pavilion. Councillor Gardner. Thank you, Mayor. I've just read the exhibit summary with everyone, so we know what we're talking about. Um, this all provides an overview of the community consultation outcome of the design consideration for a sports lighting upgrade and a new all gender pavilion at the Billboard Pool Recreation Reserve. In December 2021, um, Council submitted an application to Sport and Rectic um, Country Football Netball Program for new sports lighting at the Oval and the Netball Court. The outcome of this funding application has yet to be determined as the funding body has advised of some concerns they have received from two local residents at the project. Council officers were asked to consider alternative designs for the oval lighting, with the oval aim to reduce the height of the poles. SRV also requested that council officers undertake further community consultation, presenting any revised designs to the community for feedback and for a recommended option to be presented to council for consideration and endorsement. Throughout several rounds of community consultation, officers have attempted to resolve, resolve design-related concerns raised by residents. The design options have been proposed with the recommended option of four new light bulbs, 24 metres in height, with four LED luminaries on each bulb, considered to be effectively address concerns such as spill, uh, light spill, pole height, pole location, pole colour and heritage considerations. Two residents remain strongly opposed to the lighting upgrade around the Oval. Further consideration has been undertaken with these residents and a summary of that is attached. That's up is, is also currently assessing a council application to the local sports infrastructure fund for construction of a new all agenda for being a reserve um, for netball and tennis and football plans on it. As the concerns of the residents have informed the Minister of their development of the reserve, including the pavilion, SRV would like Council to consider the designs and a community consultation and for the plans to be presented to Council for endorsement. Um, and councils will note they're all attached. Council officers have undertaken consultation on pavilion designs with Melbourne residents, in particular those who reside adjacent to the reserve. Overall feedback has been positive and three residents have raised concerns for consideration. Of particular concern to the residents is how the design responds to heritage considerations. Council officers have responded to these concerns, informing them of the heritage considerations that have been included in the final design, including picture proof, material and colour choice, all of which have been informed by advice from the Council's Heritage Advisor and are sympathetic to the model design guidelines. A summary of further consultation with these three residents is attached. Um, the design plans, both sports lighting and the pavilion, are presented to Council for consideration and endorsement. And I would um, recommend to my fellow Councillor that we um, agree to um, the recommendation as printed. Is that second to Councillor Gordy? <coughs> Councillor Gardner? Yeah, um, I think I've pretty much explained most of it. Um, I know um, Karen and Troy and their team have been working for a very long time um, with the Bill Bill Whitfall Committee um, to look at these design options. Um, and I really need to acknowledge their effort in that because it has been done for a while. Um, and obviously, Melbourne is um, very um, heritage focused sometimes. 
Um, this is a sporting oval. The um, the actual design guidelines don't apply to the oval. Unlike the Zorgan Ambience, it's sort of a vague area. However, the designs are in accordance with it. Um, and so is the street, the new light lights. Through, I know those um, community consultations, I was there for one of them. Um, but there's two main people who live around the Oval who are not happy, I suppose. And I think it's also been noted in the report um, they're not happy with um, the Oval completely and would actually like to see it moved. Now, the Oval obviously is 120 odd years old, and it's named after um, a um, <laughs> Captain of Australia, I believe. So it's unlikely it's going to be moved. Um, in terms of the lights, I know that um, through this process there was a number of options designed and considered, um, and the feedback from the community was incorporated. And the option um, is the looking front doors uh, option three, which is uh, all lights. So I think at the moment there's six. Okay, this four. Sorry, I thought there was more. So there's these four lights already, um, and the new hole, um, hole heights, which will be a little bit higher, um, and that's to sort of um, contain spill as well. So there is reasons for it. The community people who were objected um, are still indicated they're not happy with that. Um, and it's sort of a similar thing with the actual um, female trans runs. Um, Essentially, there's a couple of people who don't want to be. The design for the change rooms have also been through the Billwood Pool Tennis Club, football club, netball as well. They were very keen um, to see these things happen um, for their local community. Um, and the actual design of the change room with facilities um, meet the heritage guidelines, and there was changes made to the design to incorporate some of that feedback as well. Um, all in all, the grant, I think, um, is over a million dollars, um, and council's also making a significant contribution as well towards this project of about 800,000. Um, so it's a big project. Um, whilst there are some people who live around the Oval who aren't happy with it, overwhelmingly, the community is very happy and it's really exciting to see this. Um, and it would be a great asset to the shrine. So I would um, give my fellow councillors to uh, support it. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Uh, thanks, thanks, ma'am. I'd, I'd just like to say that uh, the, the plans of the proposed facility <coughs> and the, uh, the uh, lighting design look fantastic. And I think this is going to be a tremendous project for the community. Um, it's going to create lots of opportunities, but also it's going to provide first-class uh, facilities, particularly for younger, younger people to be able to train in, under decent lighting and have proper um, change facilities. And um, I think it's just going to be a wonderful project. And um, yeah, when you think about it, there hasn't been really much done for the, uh, for the um, teenage group, if you like, around uh, some of our towns for some time. And I think this is a Fantastic step in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you. Any other councillor? Councillor Poole? Can I just, can I just ask a clarification? Um, I know in the, in the report it talks about a uh, all gender years, and the plans talk about female friendly. Is there a difference? Um, yeah. Councillor, uh, Director, any yeah, director of the answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Councillor, for that question. Um, an old gender, old gender facility encourages all genders, uh, not just female or male genders, to come and utilise the facility. <laughs> the design and the specifications of the design are slightly separate. Uh, they don't separate out female and male. They allow for a facility to uh, be inclusive to accommodate for. Um, all genders are acknowledged by people who use the facility. Thank you. Uh, 
Something's happening at the Bill of Woodfall Oval because as long as I've been a councillor, there's been calls for something to happen. And it's always been, no, we're going somewhere else, but it's too hard in London. So now they're getting new lights and looking at what happened in Chilton, where the bigger poles and the bigger, brighter lights have actually led to less spill and more contained light on the, on the uh, soccer ground there. I'm sure a similar thing will happen here and the residents will be happier than they were with the lighting class, but also the, uh, a new pavilion. That's fantastic. So all power to Margaret and more power to our uh, officers who obviously have spent considerable effort in um, helping the residents to understand the situation and seeking out approval. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Henderson. We might also note that um, Harcourt and Houston also had new lights put up in the last two years. A very progressive council, council members. Those in favour of the motion. <coughs> Carry. Is a window of additions for the purpose of the funding bodies to show that it was unanimous? That it was unanimous or do. <coughs> Sorry, Is it worth putting in the vision to demonstrate to the funding bodies that it was unanimous? You can answer the vision, yes. The division, yeah. division, yes. That, the division, those in favour? So we have Councillor Gardner, McClure, Scordy, Driscoll, Henderson, Amir, and Maltby. Thank you. Thank you. Then takes that then takes us to 913. 913 Mount Alexander Middle Years Plan 2020 2023 Progress Report. Councillor Anita. Councillor Doctors for Mount Alexander Middle Years Plan 2020 2023 at its ordinary meeting held on 18th August 2020. The Mount Alexander Middle Years Plan aims to support the needs of children aged 8 to 12 years and their families, with the vision that all children and families in Mount Alexander Shire are happy, safe, active and connected. The plan is a community-driven plan initiated by Council. The local Baloch Children and Youth Network has taken on the role of steering group for the plan and amended its terms of reference to reflect this role. The Baloch Children and Youth Network brings together organisations that provide services to eight to 24 year olds in the Shire. The network develops and implements strategies to meet the needs of children and young people, Facil facilitates the sharing of resources and professional capacity building, and advocates for local child and youth priorities at a regional, state and federal level. Each action in the plan is defined as either a high, medium or high priority in which to be implemented. An implementation plan was developed to map the delivery of each action over the three years of the plan. High priority actions were assigned to year one, which was 2020 to 2021, medium actions to year two, which was 2021 to 2022, and low priority actions to year three, 2022 to 2023. The plan is currently in year two, and 83% of the medium and high priority actions in the plan have been completed or are ongoing. I would like to move the recommendation that Council notes the Mount Alexander Middle Years Plan 
2020 to 2023 progress report. Thank you. Is there a seconder? Councillor Driscoll, Councillor Mia. Um, so I think that having the middle years plan is really important because the middle years are an often kind of forgotten about age bracket. Um, and what a lot happens in the years between eight to twelve. So we've got, you know, we have a lot of focuses on early years a lot of the time and a lot of focus on kind of teenagers, but often this middle group is forgotten. And I think it's great that we have this plan because um, especially after the disruptive couple of years we've had, uh, the kids who are in this age bracket at the moment are travelling a bit differently than they used to. Um, and I think parenting has become a little bit different as well. So, yeah, it's, it's great that we have this um, plan that's just for them. So the three priorities of the plan are happy and safe kids, active and adventurous kids, and connected kids and families. And there's a whole bunch of um, priorities and actions. I'm just going to pick a couple that I think that I've kind of had experience with. And um, I've, got a, I've got a middle years child who's 10 now, so right in the middle of middle years. And I know that... Um, that a lot of these programs have made it to her school, especially things like the Making Friends with Worry program. So this was delivered to all students in grades uh, four to six in nine local primary schools. And it really taught them how to normalise worrying about things and not feeling like there was something wrong with them if they were worrying. Because for a little while there, the world was quite scary for kids in that age bracket. You know, they're old enough to kind of understand what's going on, but often not old enough for their parents to really tell them what's happening. And I know uh, my daughter found this program incredible. I was lucky enough to sit in on it um, at the Winter's Flat, and it was a really, really great program that I think lots of adults would have benefited from as well. And I know that lots of the children in the um, in these middle years, years are able to take it kind of home and apply it at home as well, which is exciting. There's been lots and lots of training for parents um, around things like resilience, around dealing with tricky behaviours. So we often think of tricky behaviours in teens, but a lot of it is now starting in the tween years, which is included um, between ages 8 and 10, uh, 12. So it's kind of it's kind of getting younger. Um, so I attended a couple of great ones around uh, parenting in a kind of technological world and what to do with your young people as they start to get to expose to more and more technology. Um, we've also done training uh, for schools and parents uh, through Resilient Youth Australia and Youth Mental Health First Aid. There's been a great tool called the Student Disengagement Screening Tool, um, which has started being a project. It's delivered to local schools at grade six to try and ease the transition to year seven, because that's a real crunch time in young people's lives. And there's also been a wellbeing network started for principals and wellbeing staff from local primary schools. So they can kind of all chat about what's been going on for their young people. Um, also, the Castleman Skate Park was activated for that younger age bracket to what I heard was great success. Um, so, yeah, this is a really exciting plan to be a part of. I'm really excited that we have this plan um, and I'm really uh, excited to see what happens next. Thank you, Councillor Driscoll. Come on, any other councillor? Councillor McCall? No, I'm very happy to listen to that. It's, uh, it's great for a program. It's great to hear that sort of um, Feedback from the program that you've got personal experience with and working well with council. Right? So, it's a really exciting thing to have this middle plan, and I think it's having such great and enormous benefit to um, people in that age bracket and their families. Thank you. It's great to hear. All in favour? Against Gary? Nine two, the environment response to petition intersection of Sawmill and Walden Road and the Bristol. Uh, thanks, Mayor. The council received a petition on the 4th of August 2022 from residents living on Sawmill Road and Melissa Court. They've raised safety concerns at the intersection of Sawmill Road and Old Road during this highway. That petition and I'll the Shire Council to fix the intersection. Petition highways there have been several accidents over the past couple of years, and they've also highlighted increased traffic generated in that area. Council officers have undertaken an investigation of the location, including contacting the residents and undertaking traffic counts on Swanmore Road. The residents are generally most concerned with their entry into 
Pyrenees Highway, onto the Pyrenees Highway, and our vehicles are shortcutting the intersection to get onto the highway. The residents would like that the bell mouth of the intersection is sealed, bollards or barriers installed to prevent the shortcutting from or this shortcutting from occurring. The traffic volumes using the intersection average about 110 vehicles per day, with nearly 50% of this volume turning off the lesser court. There's been one recorded casualty crash at the intersection in the last six years. Now, the Pyrenees Highway is the responsibility of the Department of Transport, and the intersection is within 100 kilometres per day. Based on the investigation, on our investigation, it's recommended that improvement works are undertaken at the intersection to improve the safety aspect and reduce the long term maintenance. Um, I'd like to put forward a recommendation that um, Council one approves initial works to straighten the sawmill road alignment by reshaping drains and creating mulch garden beds for tree planting, as well as installing signage and additional white posts. Two, Notes the recommended longer term works to seal the bell mouth of Sawmill Road intersection and install a guard fence uh, will, will be included on the capital works program and form a future budget bid. Three notes council officers will advocate for the Department of Transport to incorporate the longer term recommendation recommended works into future safety improvement projects for the Pyrenees Highway at this location. Thanks, Councillor Driscoll. Second, Councillor McClure. Councillor Driscoll, do you wish to comment any further? Um, no, no, except uh, that um, this is in my, my particular area, and, and I've had several people come to me and um, I've told them to do a petition, which they've done, and um, handed to us, and we've looked at that, and, and um, we've come to the same conclusion. So I just sort of say, if people have these concerns, put a petition in. We might not always uh, be able to get the right outcome for you, but we'll, we'll try. Um, that's all. That's the uh, I'd just like to ask a couple of questions of it, our director in relation to the proposal. Um, I see in the uh, in the documents there, Director Near, it says that the uh, the verges or whatever will be uh, set up to uh, plant, plant trees and the like. And I'm just, you know, in terms of I wouldn't like to see that blocking or obscuring vision up and down the road because that's the whole whole thing is you know people are trying to get out there and beat the traffic. So just I think we need to be very careful about the design in terms of maintaining good visibility. The other thing is I couldn't see on the drawing a little bit earlier, but I couldn't see does it have a, a stop or a giveaway sign there in the, uh, in the new proposal? That's, that's two, two things. Thank you. Thank you. Any other councillor wish to comment? Uh, Director Anita, sorry. Uh, so, uh, thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Councillor Courtney. So, definitely uh, the points you raised with regard to the proposal for the, the garden bed, vegetation, the trees, etc., will be made designed in line with the required sight lines and the road standards. So, I think they're going to be put back a bit to be able to ensure that it's contained. Um, and requirements for sign you could do to a capable process, but there's nothing there at the moment. So those things are part of the, 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 the sorry, the media works. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All those in favor of the motion against carried. <coughs> Nine point three, the economy. 9.31, budget carried forward from 2021 to 20. 2021-22 to 22-23. Councillor McClure. Excuse me. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Um, the purpose of this report is to provide councillors with the items recommended to be carried forward from the 2021-2022 budget to the 2022-23 budget. Um, the recommendation is that Council adopts the 2022-2023 budget carry forwards recommended by the Executive in Attachment 9.3.1.1 and two, note that if approved, the adjusted budget will form the basis of quarterly financial reports for 
Second. Second. Councillor Driscoll, comments? Thanks, Mayor. Um, each year, the Council adjusts the adopted annual budget for such items as previously approved but incomplete capital works or special projects and projects that are grant funded, grant funded where the funding has either not been fully spent or has not or has been received in advance. Um, there are quite a few projects, uh, of 44 projects recommended to carry forward, six of multi-year projects, 23 projects that received 3.14 million in unbudgeted grant income during the year, uh, 21 projects are grant-funded projects, and the total request for these projects is $6.26 million. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Councillor Anderson? I think it should be said that this is an extraordinarily large amount of carry forward. I think the CEO would agree. And I'm um, sorry to the mayor. We also agree, and it's because of the amount of money that's come in, maybe a lot of it because of COVID um, funding. Have the works funding, trying to get the economy moving, get money into the system, local projects, etc. And we've been the winning recipients, but it does mean that our, our normal program of have a couple of works in operation just haven't been able to keep pace. But I'm confident that uh, our staff will be able to um, get the works done as well as um, what's in our current budget. But um, it is quite an extraordinary situation. Thank you. Any further discussion? Those in favour? Carried. 132, 2021 22 annual plan progress report quarter four, Councillor Driscoll. Thanks, Ben. Um, the quarter four annual plan progress report is to the end of June 2022, provides council with an update on projects in the 2021-22 plan. Uh, I'd like to move the council notes, the annual plan progress report for 21-22, quarter four. Second up, Councillor O'Neill. Is Councillor Driscoll, do you wish to comment? I just, uh, in, in the uh, document that we've got, most of the most of the um, status that's completed, there's some of you that haven't been completed, but uh, most of what we've, we've got there most of the time. And some are ongoing that haven't now been done in the year, but uh, they're 99.5% completed. Any other councillor wish to comment? Uh, I'll just make one point. Um, I think we need to get some Staff should be proud of what we managed to do, what's been done in uh, some very difficult circumstances. Yeah. Thanks, Councillor Henderson. All in favour? It's carried. 933 2021 2022 financial and performance statements. Director Knight, you might like to make a comment. Thank you, Mayor Mulvey. I'm just wanting to provide further clarification to the report that's included in the agenda for tonight. On page 47 of the Council agenda, it is noted that due to the timing of this meeting and the audit, any changes requested from the audit will be communicated after the September meeting of Council. Council's financial auditors are currently undertaking a final review of the financial statements before forwarding to Vargo for their review and certification. We are expecting a response from Vargo in the next week. Outcomes and finalisation of the final management letter, which incorporates the 2021-2022 financial report and performance statements, will then be able to be made. In accordance with Council's legislative requirement, this certified or signed version of the statement will also be circulated and attached to the 2021 and 2022 annual report. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cordy. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mayor. Um, I'd like to um, 
move that Council one upon endorsement by order of the risk committee approves in principle the draft financial and performance statements for 21-22. Two, to authorise the Council of Maltby and Council of Driscoll to certify the statements in their final form after any changes recommended or agreed to by the auditors have been made. Three, authorise the principal accounting officer to make any changes to the financial and performance statements that may arise out of the audit. Four, requires the principal accounting officer to notify councillors and the chair of the audit risk committee of any proposed material changes to be made to the, any of the statements. <coughs> Five, sends a copy of the statements in their final form to the members of the audit and risk committee. Six, notes the final copy of the statements will be included in the annual report. Thank you, Senator. Councillor McClure, Councillor Cordy. Um, just a point of clarification, I'm sure um, the CEO or Director Knight will uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's actually a council that approves the, uh, the end of year financial statements. And uh, by, by when council vote on this, then uh, subject to minor changes that the auditors may recommend, um, it's actually right to go. So uh, just a point of clarification, I hope I've got that right. But in terms of the, um, the financial statements, I think um, I'd just like to uh, commend the work of um, uh, Director Knight and um, Carolyn Ross and Robin Sterling. She's had the name change, but uh, and also the finance and management team. But it's a fantastic report, and uh, yeah, there's a huge amount of work work done. And uh, yeah, I read I read the uh, financial statements from cover to cover, and including all the qualification notes and uh, it just makes you realise what a huge task is done and it's done every year and uh, I'm satisfied that the council is uh, still operating in very sound financial shape and I'm very happy to support that report. Thank you. Thank you. Any other council wish to comment? That's all the comment. Um, just, just to, to notice with a bit of concern, the uh, the workforce turnover, um, which has been nominated there as a percentage of staff turnover, that almost all had it done was um, increased due to demand for employment turnover across all ministries post COVID, which is a concern trend that we should be using that. It does it. But that is a great report, and uh, all the other indicators look good. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Councillor Gardner? <coughs> Just wanted to point out that. Um, obviously, including what Tony said, great work. Um, but I suppose for the benefit of the audience, so maybe you two, if anyone's willing to listen, um, that this says we have a surplus of um, 3.15 million and we have cash, large cash crap balance for about 32 million, which is um, there for um, what we call a lot of um, discretionary reserves for future purposes. So, um, Coming out of COVID, this council is in a very good financial position. I think that's a really good thing that we should give away. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, you might comment on that last comment. <laughs> Sorry, me, yes. I, I think that the council again was referring to the non discretionary commitments. Yes. Oh, yes. Sorry. Yes, I was. <laughs> It's all still there. Yeah, it's all there. The money's there. It's, you know, <laughs> counting down with my time. All those in favour of the against Kerry. Kelly has reports. Councillor Cordy. Thanks, Mayor. I'm just going to get to my right sheet. Um, two, two reports. Um, firstly, uh, Friday, the CEO and I attended a uh, a special state council meeting of the Municipal Association of Victoria to vote on rule changes. This has been in the pipeline for some time. And um, one of the things that was quite interesting on the day is some of the some metropolitan councils attempted to delete the proposed change that would result in one council, one vote under the existing rules of. MAB, the Metropolitan Councils 
enjoy two votes per council. So uh, it gives me a, a huge advantage in terms of uh, voting power. So um, the rule change is one, of, is one of the key elements that's being changed. So all of the uh, member councils have, uh, have one vote. And after much debate, the proposed changes were eventually adopted. So uh, they basically were endorsed as, um, as circulated. Uh, which is really a, uh, a, a strong vote of support for uh, for rural councils, and uh, the uh, rural changes are now subject to uh, approval by the Victorian state government. But uh, was certainly um, well worthwhile um, to see our and our being in attendance because the voting was uh, quite tight. So it was a very serious matter. So that's that one. Any just further discussion, or uh, I'll move on to my other report. Um, earlier today, I attended an, an on property ram sale at Beverly Stud at Sutton Grange, property is owned by the Barty family. The sale was uh, run by Nutrient Bendigo. It was very well supported at sale, both by local and interstate buyers. Uh, it was interesting to see. Uh, Rams being purchased to go to um, uh, New South Wales and uh, South Australia, I believe, but also Tasmania. So, a beautiful day in Sutton Grange. Bidding was very brisk on, on most lots on offer. And my estimate is there would have been um, a, a clearance of over 90% of, of the lots that offered. So, congratulations to the Barty family on the way the stock were presented. And the success of the sale. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Cordy. Is that the um, report? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a, it's a blue ribbon, blue ribbon event, and uh, yeah, certainly uh, Sutton Grange has some fabulous farms out there and some fabulous farming operators, and uh, it was certainly uh, a pleasure to be out there, even though I did get. Uh, Three re requests to attend to the road out there. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> right. Thank you. Councillor Nia, you have a report. Um, I have a couple. So, um, a few weeks ago, I attended uh, a new group for me. Uh, the Casamine Railway Precinct Master Plan Project Reference Group, very long name. We tried to come up with something shorter, but we didn't quite get there. Um, so this is around, obviously, coming up with a, a master plan for the railway precinct. And so that includes kind of all the way down to where the Bell Guides Hall is, and then all the way back up to where the mill is, and trying to get that corridor to work a bit better, because everyone agrees that it's not the best it could be right now. Um, it was a really really useful and uh, positive uh, meeting uh, where we kind of got into groups. We did a lot of brainstorming. Uh, the people from the, the Goldfields Railway were there. There were people from uh, Lions, lots of older groups from around there. It was really good. Um, so there's, there's kind of a, a draft plan being done at the moment. Um, obviously, this is still up on shape for consultation. So encourage the people in your lives to get on shape and consult on some of these things, but I found it a really positive experience. And I'm really kind of excited for that whole corridor to be a bit nicer than it is. Um, I also sat on a new, another new group, uh, a community reference group for the Housing and Neighbourhood Character Strategy, which I'm chairing. It's the first community reference group I've ever chaired. I think I did a pretty good job. Um, it's a really great group. I think it's the most, uh, kind of active or wanting to be active group I've ever been a part of. So uh, everyone who attended was kind of like, what more can we do? We want to be more involved. We want to sit in the car with the person driving around and look at the houses and make sure they're looking at it right. So everyone is really is really keen to be involved and to make the most of what I think is a pretty great opportunity to finally have a neighbourhood character strategy, um, which we don't currently have. And I think we run into problems with that a lot. Um, yeah, it's, it's, been, it's been really exciting to be part of that. 
This is also out on shape for um, consultation at the moment. Um, and this is one that we really don't want to get wrong. So the more people who can give feedback, the better. So this is one I suggest everyone does a lot of pushing in their communities because I think this is a really great chance to get this neighbourhood character strategy for Campbell's Great Fortune for Castle Maine. So we have it. And I think it's going to make things a lot easier going forward. Um, I've also been to a couple of La La Magawa community management meetings. There's quite a lot happening there because it's a massive space. I haven't really been there and looked at the, you know, the amount of area that's there, but my dad made me go on a hike. I refused to get on my bike, so we walked it. Um, I've got bike fear still, but I'm working on it. We walked it, and it's just a beautiful, beautiful place. And she and I sat up there and lots, I watched lots of different kind of community people riding their bikes and, you know, lots of different ages. It was fantastic. It is really, really hard to maintain. So most of our meetings are about all the problems with the park and the fact that, um, you know, it, it, needs, it needs a lot of help and uh, there's no money. So while it's, it's great to be a part of it, it's also a bit depressing sometimes because it is this beautiful asset that has uh, no incoming funds and there needs to be quite a lot done to keep it safe and enjoyable. Even things like we're now down to the point where we're all having to take turns of cleaning the toilet. And it's not really what I feel like doing, but I'm taking one to the team and doing it for this year. But there, there needs to be a lot of work done there, especially if we want to have a Commonwealth Games event there, I think. Um, sorry, that's what it is. Whose asset is it? It is a dealt asset. No, no. Yes, but that doesn't mean much. I mean, they're, they're not giving any money to it. So it's, it's challenging, but it's a very beautiful area. Um, on the cards, too, they're redeveloping the kind of camping ground and whole parking, parking <laughs> toilet situation near the Oaks. So it's a bit more uniform and there'll be less damage done to trees and, and nature. It'll all be a bit more regulated. So hopefully that it will be done, maybe by the end of the year, even if it's been a long process. The last one that I've been doing a lot of work on is um, the early, the new early years plan consultation. So that is also out on shape. Get the small people in your lives or their carers to get on there and talk about what is going to make life better for our um, eight-year-olds and under. And I've been doing my uh, community consultation at my school with the Prep 1 2s. I spent an hour and a half with them last week, asked them two questions. I said, What do you love about living in this area and what would make it better for you? And they um, drew me pictures and they wrote some words and I wrote some words for them. Lots of great ideas. They care very much about trees. They don't want us to chop down trees, they want us to plant more trees. They care very much about animals, they want us to be nice to animals. They care very much about having a big pool with a playground and hopefully a bucket that tips on it, just like a going on Yara. Very interested in a pool. They would also like a rocket launch pad if we can accommodate that. But I, I did tell them that, you know, realistically, that might be for a future council. Um, but the big things that the, the kids really care about. And, and the thing, I mean, the, the first question was nicer because the things they love about Castle Lane and their areas, wherever they're living, are friendly people and nature and trees and the fact that they can go out on the bike on their bikes and feel safe. And we raided all the playgrounds and they love all the playgrounds. Um, it was a really nice thing to do because often when I do movie consultation, it is not very positive hanging out with, with a bunch of five, six, seven-year-olds and listening to them talk about what makes this place special for them was very, very nice for me. Um, and especially listening to the things that they noticed that they want better. Just being able to get on their bike or their trike and get to school on a footpath and not a road, you know, just things like that. They do notice these things that maybe sometimes we don't, um, we don't think that they do. So I've been really enjoying doing that. It's open for a couple more weeks and after that we'll start putting a new plan together. Um, and I just want to say thank you to Sally, who's our early news officer, um, and Paul uh, for really driving that and they've been doing a fantastic job. So that's it from me. Thank you. Any other councillor got a report? See you. Here we go. Stop. Thank you, Mayor. 
uh, as as always, I've circulated the list of activities that yourself and I have been up to uh, over the last month since the last meeting, and uh, I do hope that there's a number of activities in the centre of that first page that uh, Director Knight was uh, kind enough to attend on my behalf because I was uh, in Canberra for the first half of last week and then in Melbourne for the second half of last week on council business, which I'll talk about in a moment. And, uh, and Councillor Court has already mentioned what we were doing in Melbourne uh, late last week. Um, the, uh, I wanted to mention uh, the visit that I did have to Canberra and also, before I do that, something that's not on the, uh, that list of activities but something that happened in the last month, which was the release of the Long and Capacity Regional Economic Development Strategy, which you all have a copy of. Um, this is a really important document that was an initiative of the Rodney Capacity Regional Partnership. It really has uh, sought to bring together what are all of the things that we need, and they're not purist economic development type thoughts. There's many aspects to it that are going to lead to us having a, a prosperous and prosperous community and a, and a great place to live. It's trying to pick up on all of the, the really significant initiatives from each of the, the there's actually 10 councils that have contributed to this. Um, for each of the councils involved in that process. Um, so uh, very, uh, a really important document. Big thank you to Regional Development Victoria for funding this, this project through the Regional Partnership Initiative. And uh, I know that this document, uh, when we developed this idea at the Regional Partnership and presented that idea in the Cabinet, the Cabinet thought it was such a good idea that this is now what is being developed across the entire state. And so, uh, it's it's a significant document. It's, it's really an important one that talks about what's important for the progress of our entire region, but also the progress for our community here in Mount and Shire. So, really encourage you to consider what's in that document. And take the opportunity to, to promote that when you, whenever you have your discussions with the community and with other levels of government. Related to that, but not not necessarily for the same thing, was the the Canberra visit was uh, to attend the region's rising national summit. From there, originally, it was also to include us visiting some politicians, but uh, of course, uh, with uh, Parliament deciding to halt its proceedings due to the Queen Elizabeth II passing away, uh, we didn't have that opportunity. So it was just myself and Mayor attending the region's rising national summit. Uh, that was an initiative that was developed by Regional Australia Institute, which is a, a group that does fantastic work for promoting all that Regional Australia has to offer, and that's regional means, rural communities, regional cities, and remote communities. And depending on where you live in Australia, you've probably got to think about what that means. But it essentially means all the non-big capital city areas throughout Australia. It's trying to represent the needs and the wants of those communities. That's not easy. Uh, we try to do that in the council plan here for a small community, hence it's not easy. So it's, it's a big task they have, but they've developed uh, a document called the Regionalisation Ambition 2032, a framework to rebalance the nation. And that's really what that, that conference was about, that summit was about, was helping people to understand what's the opportunity that's in that document, why does it say what it says, and also promoting that as uh, something that we should all get behind to really push for more investment from federal and state government into what all of regional Australia needs to be prosperous, remote, rural and regional cities, that is. But I just wanted to um, pick up on a couple of things in there. Uh, one of the things that was really pleasing is, uh, of course, the new Minister for Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development and Local Government in federal government is Catherine King, who is, of course, the local member in Ballarat. So, very, very much understands our community. We've had a relationship with Catherine for many years. Um, really great to see that we get, getting that role and, and the opportunity that presents for us in, and this, this region. The second thing was the, the opportunity to hear from the, the new junior minister or outer minister for local government, which was Minister McVeigh from Newbury, and uh, just a fantastic uh, proponent for the work of local government. She was, um, uh, as, a, as quite a young person, she became 
a member of her local council in a rural community and became the mayor and got a really deep understanding about the challenges that you all face uh, and, and try and how hard it is to do things for your community. So she's now taking that into federal government, that perspective and that understanding. I think that can only be fantastic news for all of regional Australia. She spoke passionately for about an hour or so about her views about regional Australia and what we need to do and how important it is to support local government to do their work. So I was, I was very excited to listen to the way that she spoke about the, the work that we all do and, and what they would like to do as government to work more with us. Very strong message about working more with local government, respecting more of work with local government. A little bit more, Mary, if I may. Sure. Uh, just a, a bit of a context about what's in the document. That they take this picture of that federation, just under two thirds of all Australians lived in regional Victoria, just under two thirds of that federation. Now, about a third of Australians live in regional Victoria. So there's a one third shift in uh, where people live in, in, in Australia. And that's really what this document is about, that title about rebalancing the nation is, is suggesting that at the moment about nine and a half million people live in regional Australia. By 2032, without any change in current direction, the prediction is about 10 and a half million. What this document says, if you could make that 11 million instead of 10 and a half million people living in regional Australia, you could actually increase, without increasing the total pool of people, you could increase the, the GDP of Australia by $1.8 billion. So there's a really strong financial argument to invest more into the regions to make them more attractive for all. Nine people live there, but bring more people in, and half a million more than is naturally expected to happen is what their target is about. So um, it's uh, it's it's a big plan, and I, I guess the other bit, Mayor, just to to, to finish, I've been talking about this for a very long time. So that was a terrific, that was a terrific summit for collecting information that we can use. But they they've got a uh, a listing of where are we at as a regional as regional Australia now. And where do we want to be in 2032? What are the targets that we want to set? And unsurprisingly, I guess there's not a single target in there that we can't take advantage of as a council to be promoting how we contribute to that. And I guess the, the last thing I leave from that summit there was uh, there's always someone worse off than you. And uh, the challenges are common throughout regional Australia, there's no doubt about that. But listening to the challenges of so many other places in regional Australia compared to us who are really in many ways challenged by demand management as opposed to creating demand in our community. Uh, it's, a, it's a nice position for us to be in that challenging nonetheless, but a nice position to be in. So I'll stop there and have you answer any questions on any of those items. Any questions for the CEO? Councillor Driscoll. Thanks, Mayor. Um, just the uh, local government professionals executive leadership program and uh, a note that uh, our own uh, director in here um, graduated. So what is that course? I'm not quite sure about that course and, uh, and congratulations. Uh, sure, so it's uh, what we know it as is the XLB program, which is provided by LG Pro. There's a few acronyms for you, but it's a program that's been around since um, actually since the year before I joined local government, so it's 16 years I think it's been running now, and uh, it's it's really designed for uh, the executive level people in local government to further develop their leadership skills and their understanding of the entire environment of local government. Um, all three of our executives, by the way, have been through that program. Uh, Lisa did it a number of years ago, and I did it actually 15 years ago. Uh, and Michael now has done as well. It's just a fantastic program that's put on by LG Pro to, uh, to help us keep developing as professionals in, in the sector and in all of the ways that we can think of. Um, so, yeah, congratulations to Director Anir for getting through that program. I don't know if he wants to say anything there about it. Uh, thank you, Darren. Uh, thank you, Councillor Driscoll, and uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, Firstly, thank you for the opportunity to attend the program. It was extremely rewarding um, as, a, as a person and as a professional. Um, I was able to meet with my uh, counterparts in other councils to understand 
their experience, some who are new to local government, some who have been in local government for 20 plus years. Uh, we spoke about issues of governance affecting the, the sector. We spoke about issues of strategy, um, and we spoke about issues of human resource management today, the three major themes as we go forward. Gave me a, an amazing insight um, to bring back knowledge and experiences from other councils to inform what we speak about um, at the executive and how I guide my team in, in responding to the requests of our community and helping councillors uh, in informing you in the decisions that you make as you take them forward. So thank you for that support that's been provided um, to me. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Mayor, and congratulations. Um, just two things to finish. On Friday, I had the pleasure of presiding over a citizenship ceremony for nine new citizens of, of the country from Mount Shire. I thank the council staff for the well organised event. The second one was I had the privilege, the pleasure, I should say, to attend the chaplaincy fund board for the uh, fund all the debutant board for the secondary college on Saturday night. And eight young girls uh, did their dev with some very good partners and there was probably something like 150 people in the hall it was just a good old um fashion um event I I the a description no 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 i didn't do all that but um COVID stopped it last year or the year before but this certainly this one was a, a very good one thank you That takes us to item 11. One notice is a motion. <coughs> notice of motion 2022-001. Speed limit on the Corbin Freeway. Councillor Cordy. Thanks, Fred Mayor. Um, my motion is that Council writes to Regional Roads Victoria to one, seek an explanation for the ongoing speed reduction to 80 kilometres per hour on the northbound lanes of the Colton Freeway at the Castlemaine Parkour Interchange. Two, ask that the works necessary to reinstate the Colton Freeway to 110 kilometres per hour be undertaken as a matter of urgency. And three, request a written response confirming when the required works will be undertaken. We're a second to the motion. Councillor Gardner, Councillor Cordy. Uh, thanks for the, thanks for that, um, Mayor. Um, look, basically the uh, the road. There's there's some concerns about the uh, pavement on the uh, northbound section of the road. Now, just for clarification, we're not talking about the intersection with Holiday Gap Road. We're talking about uh, much closer to Harcourt. And a little bit of background for um, YouTube visitors or viewers that are watching this, it cost of the order of 200 million to uh, to do the Harcourt um, bypass. And to, to facilitate that project, my count was that 43 family homes went under the road. Most of those were never replaced and it's taken Harcourt many years to recover. So my concern is that poor quality maintenance is effect, in effect downgrading this important Asset. And it is noted that it's a uh, it's a high highway of national significance. To make it worse, this morning I was in Bendigo, and on return, the highway at South Ravenswood has been reduced to one lane and um, sixty kilometres per hour. Now you might say, okay, there's there's some damage to the road, but you know the road's been reduced to that and uh, you know how many people were working on that national road, a road of national significance? There were none working on it. So we've got one section at 60 kilometres an hour on the, from Bendigo to Melbourne. We've got uh, a section adjacent to Harcourt where it's been downgraded to 80 kilometres an hour. And what, what I noticed in my working life, I commuted to Melbourne for about 10 years to work. And um, there used to be uh, potholes at Wood End, and uh, the potholes at Wood End took about 
10 years to fix. <laughs> and I just thought, well, if council could write to uh, uh, regional roads Victoria, we might be able to improve their timeline. Time so, uh, um, look, I know, I know the roads um, is very expensive to maintain, and um, you know, but it's it's a very important road, and we'd like to see some action, and we certainly don't want to see it downgraded for for ten years. I think that's enough. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Cordy. Any other councillor wish to contribute? Um, Tony said everything. Tony said everything. All right, all those in favour of the motion? The motion's carried. Do you wish a division? Me? No. Yes. Yes, he does. Can we have a division, please? So, yeah. so we have Councillor Cordy, McClure, Gardner, Driscoll, Henderson, Amir, and Maltby. Thank, Thank you. you. We have no well, we have no urgent special business. We have no confidential items. Oh. Therefore, I declare the meeting closed and thank you for your attendance.